The northeast of Scotland doesn't advertise itself like Westeros of the Highlands. It's so agriculturally rich, most of the scenery is man-made. If you speed north from Aberdeen to Peterhead, it's almost monotonously prosperous. It's a different story if you take one of the wee roads twisting down to the North Sea. This bit is known as Treeless Buchan, and in less than half a mile, I'll come to Collison Village. Collison Fishing Village was noted for a very special delicacy. Spellings, haddocks and whiting, sun-dried on the rocks and grilled with butter that were supposed to be delicious. And one man who was very fond of them was the air craftsman Shaw, Lawrence of Arabia, who lived in that house for two years. It was very primitive then, no water, he had to carry his own coal and everything else. And these years of mystery have never really been fully explained, but there's a man in this village that I would like to talk to because he knows a great deal about that time. I'm off to see him. It almost comes as a shock of pleasure, the wee harbour situated in a cliffy bowl with houses perched at all angles and its slopes. It's like a wee bit of Cornwall. I love the way this path contours right round the harbour, which was built in 1894, when everybody got a living from the sea. Sixteen boats were fishing herrings in these days of sail, and it must have made a picturesque scene. And there wouldn't be many outside visitors to enjoy it. It's popular now because of the motor car. In fact, it's a commuter village now, and such boats as are here are mainly for pleasure. Jake. Oh, hello, Tom. Hi. How are you? Nice to see you. Oh, fine to see you. And at the gardening. Well, I'm not actually a gardener. I'm a come fisherman come gardener. Well, it's looking very well. Oh, well, like anything else, you've just got to wait on things to grow. Ah, well, it hasn't been very good year. No, no, it isn't very bad. Well, this morning, when I was coming through the harbour there, I was looking at the house which Lawrence of Arabia lived in. That's right. And I've never really known much about that, and I was told that you were the man who could tell me. Do you remember him? Yes, I remember perfectly well, yes. And he had his broth superior motorbike, and he, he had his riding breeches, uh, which the, the dispatch riders used to have during the war, and that, and his cap turned round about with the, the snoot at the back and the goggles, yes. An eccentric man, I would have said he was. But... Uh, uh, I think he came here to get away from it all. What was he like in appearance? Well, it, uh, not too tall, but uh, sharp features. He had long chin, and he used to just go into a couple old Mr. and Mrs. Walker. That's the only people that he was friendly with. But he used to go up to the shop to get his pan drops. That's all imperial mints and his paraffin. And the hovel that he lived in, well, it was just about as primitive as perhaps you'd get a one in the Highlands. Sand, floor, no linoleum or anything like that. Looks a good house now. Well, it's been re reconstructed in 1936, you see. This is just what happens. But, uh, but long ago, all the houses where I was born, you had the box bed, and it was uh, all cast, chaff, you know, and we used to have to sleep up the stairs. It wasn't lined. It was uh, the, the tiles, and uh, there was... Quite a few of us. And it was a good going fishing village then? Well, 1860, there was 442 inhabitants in Colston and approximately 170 fishermen. There was as high as 64 boats of different varieties. That included the heron boats. It was the most prolific uh, bay for place. 
and then the winter time you go to cod and then the haddock and uh, of course the haddock and the whiting were made into speldings which was a, a luxury wow. dried fish that was the stuff that Lawrence really liked he liked that but uh, uh, he also liked what we call the yellow fish which was a smoked fish because every fisherman had a smokehouse where they used to smoke their fish when they couldn't get the speldings dried now Dick, the first time I met you I met you with a rope round your shoulder you were supposed to be collecting firewood, but in fact you were looking for a cache of gin. Yes, and I, before I die, I think I'll get it yet, because smuggling was very rife in this coast. 1798, Philip Kennedy was killed by the gauger, who was the foreman exciseman, because a big quantity of contraband had been landed. Now, 1803, there was four schooners of 100 tons and 200 tons burden used to run from Colston with hide and tallow and barrels of salmon down to Folkestone and that's where the agent were and brought back the contraband. How did you signal to the men whether it was safe to come in or not? Ah, this was, it was all the houses with the gables onto the sea had small windows but a foot square and they used to put the blanket over there or put the light in when it was safe for them to run. Dick Ingram's clifftop house looks inland to the sands of Forvey, the strangest mixture in Scotland of heather moor and billowing sand dunes, outstanding for wildlife. It's an important national nature reserve, but what about management problems? The main problems are complex ones, ones of people interacting with wildlife, um, problems of the sort of damage that can occur from um, the type of things that people want to do here, windsurfing, shooting, this sort of thing. The majority of them, people are pretty good and enjoy it um, without causing too much damage. But it's like everywhere else, you have to strike a balance. We get a lot of school visits all year round, uh, mostly concentrated in the summer, but we do get them at other times of the year and they come here. We spend as much time as we can out on the reserve and hopefully they'll carry this feeling on with them as they get older and grow up learning to appreciate and look after the countryside. And right at the mouth, you've got these tremendous sandbars. It's almost like a small Sahara. And that's where yeah. all the terns are. Yeah. Yes, most of the terns are down there now. It's a very important colony. We've suffered from problems of numbers going up and down over the past few years, but then that's the sort of thing that they do anyway. It's a classic case of where the estuary and the dune system being next to each other um, double each other's importance, if that makes sense. The birds are getting all the food that they need and a lot of shelter in the estuary. It's a good place to take the young. And, of course, they've got an ideal breeding place on the next to the estuary in the dune system. And the eider ducks, I believe it's about the largest concentration you can find in Britain here. Um, something like 7,000 birds in the estuary. Um, early May, mid-May, which is the peak time. So it, over the years, it's built up to be really a massive colony. Yeah, and the amazing thing is the variety of food that they find here. Yes, the, the eiders, in, in fact, do more or less monopolize the mussels. Um, that's their main prey species. But um, with so many different birds, there, are, there is no competition in some senses, because even when two different species of birds are feeding on the same food supply, like oyster catchers and gulls on the mussels and eiders on the mussels, they take a different size, so they don't compete. And as you say, there's lugworm, there's ragworm, there's cockles, there's mussels. Tons and tons of food in there, which is really the big attractant to all the birds, both summer and winter, of course, as well. In terms of big estuaries, of course, it's a, it's a relatively small one, but in terms of North East Scotland, it's a very, very important one, the largest on this stretch of coast by any means. This is all that remains of a village buried below the sands. The 12th century church was excavated. There is a tradition that the agricultural land was buried with the village, 
as the result of a curse put upon it by a girl, one of three rightful heirs to this inheritance. A wicked uncle cast the three adrift in a leaky boat, hoping they would all drown. One survived to utter the words, Let nocht be fund and forbes glebes, but thistle bent and sand. True enough, that's all there is there now, and the only people who can win a living on it, apart from the nature reserve warden Bob Davis, are the salmon fishermen who work the tides with stake and bag nets. Salmon have been netted here for 200 years, and since the tides don't work office hours, it can be dangerous going out in darkness and rough seas. Powerful lights have to be used then for safety, and there's always a chance of being bitten by a seal if one happened to be inside the nets. Each net costs 800 pounds, and they have to be cleaned each time after use, otherwise the salmon would smell them and keep away. Stake nets have to be emptied before the tide gets too low or the fish would batter each other and be descaled. Ah, the dunes have a feeling of the Sahara about them as you get closer to the river, and quite a number of boats have grounded here coming in from the sea. Gordon Bob Davis showed me a lot that day of the delights of this most unusual bit of wildlife country, and I know now why it's so notable amongst naturalists.